Covering music-related content of all genres, if it filters through Eastern Texas, it's fair game. Y'all bring it. From Texarkana down to the coast and Dallas down to Houston and everything in between, we are E-T-X Ross! <laughs> Jen Ford here to tell you about the best guitar shop around, Neil's Guitars and More in downtown Kilgore, Texas. Neil has been outfitting East Texas artists such as Cody Wayne, Adam Brown, and Rio Wallace with his great selection of acoustic guitars, mandolins, guitar strings, amps, and everything you need to get ready for your gig. Need lessons? Go see Neil. Need quick repairs? Go see Neil. You never know who you'll run into at this locally owned and operated shop. Supporting live music for years, Neil's Guitars and More at 119 North Longview Street in Kilgore, Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new episode of the ETX Rocks podcast with Boston Chris. Man, we have a treat for you guys out there today. Uh, we haven't had a metal band on the show in quite some time. Of course, you guys might know that the first one was Victims of Sanity all the way back at episode 5. And this is going to be episode 35, so it's been a minute. We're real excited. Not only do we have a metal band here, but we have the 2016 East Texas Metal Band of the Year None other than Edge of Misery. We have Speck. Hello. <laughs> Johnny Edge. What's up? Redneck. Hey, hey. And Viking. How's it going? And, of course, we don't have the other two guys. They were just like, I don't know who Boston Chris is, so, you know, <laughs> got to work or Works getting nice. food at Taco Bell. I don't know what it was, but what is up with that, guys? It doesn't matter. There's not room for two more chairs in here anyway. Yeah, I don't so. think we could have fit the other two. Yeah. Yeah. No. So... so they're, they're, they're trapped within their employment. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll tell you a little bit about uh, Edge of Misery. Um, they, they've been in the music business for 20 years uh, between the four of them, um, off and on, I guess. Bring in, uh, I'll, I'll use what uh, a real good quote that John Whitaker, Johnny Edge, said. They are bringing something new to a scene that needs revitalizing. You said that, yes, man. That is pretty poignant, man. That's how I Very feel. good stuff. So, you guys, uh, I guess you're thinking, you know, hey, the metal, the metal scene can use something like us, mm -hmm. something different, something a little bit off the wall, maybe. Exactly. And and you guys are trying to be that something. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that that's really cool. You guys have an EP that just just dropped in July, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's called Drop Dead Beautiful. Um, you cannot get that anywhere except at an Edge of Misery show right now. So you guys make sure you go on Edge of Misery on Facebook to find out where they're at. You guys have to have a copy of this EP. I promise you. Um, we'll get into a little bit about promotion on their next big show coming up on Saturday. Of course, this will be out on Thursday, two days from now. What's today's date? No. Today is so October 6th, this will drop. It'll be episode 35. <laughs> Seven people in here. Nobody knew the date, including me. That's awful. All right, so I know you guys, uh, John, you told me that your music is soon to be available on, on all the online sites, and uh, like iTunes and Spotify and things like that. Yep, yep, yep. So why have you waited so long to get your stuff out on those, on that stuff? Because I know you have a strategy. We were weighing some options earlier on. Um, we were in talks with some different things, just waiting to see where some different areas, you know, some things were going fall to get, fall in place or not. Um, and then we finally decided to just take matters into our own hands and push it out the way we're doing it now through our just self, you know, self production. It seems to be the and all independently, right? Yeah. So that that's really cool. And I know you guys want to to branch out and stuff like that. Ooh, yes. The first time I ever heard of you guys was when I was doing the Victims of Sanity show on episode five, and they were excited about opening for y'all at your EP release. And they were like, Boston, you got to check these guys out. So that's when I first heard of y'all. And, um, I mean, you guys are great. I, I really enjoy the sound. I love the visuals that y'all bring out. Um, I haven't seen y'all live yet, and I will rectify that eventually, I promise you. But I've seen the videos and the craziness that goes on. Um, so what would you guys say makes Edge of Misery unique? I'd say it's our diversity. I mean, each, every, each and every one of us come from a different background. Uh, we've got one that comes from military, uh, one that was in the music industry 10-plus years ago and guy that works at the venue and then me i was just a good old boy that worked out in the sun all day and i like to play play a guitar and <laughs> i hit these guys up on the internet they was looking for another guitar so that's how it all came together and we just kind of all fell into place also can say a lot for our individual influences every person in the band had gets you know their musical influences from a different direction 
you know, it's like what you listen to. I would love to hear those influences for sure. Well, uh, Speck, I mean, you were more into like the heavier. Yeah, like back in high school, I was into like death metal and all kinds of stuff, but I've uh, definitely diversified the music that I listen to these days, and now I seem like I write a little bit darker, doomier stuff. I gotta say, looking at you, I would never think death metal. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You said death metal, and I was like, what? <laughs> that's, that's our that's our baby face death metal guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes yeah. all the sense, boy. Yeah. I'm I'm looking at him and I'm just like, no, not death metal. Uh, for me, um, I say one of my big influences as a vocalist was always Mike Patton, of uh, of uh, Faith No More, Tomahawk, Peeping Tom, uh, Mr. Bungle. I mean, it's the man is definitely the king of eclectic music. I mean, it's he's just all over the place. And I always loved that about him. His vocal style varied so heavily that I wanted to be able to bring that into my own music. That I can, I can do go from cleans to like death metal shrieks to lower, you know, darker stuff. It's just the ability to kind of, I guess, not glue yourself in one place. Like so many singers kind of have their yeah, they put themselves their into narrow. their own box, and yeah, sometimes like, I, you can't climb out of it. Then. Yeah, I refuse to be boxed. It's like yeah. I like mixing it up. It's like I want to, I want to, people listen to a CD and be like, they only have one singer, really. You know, it's, I, I like that. You know, people yeah. are like, oh, they've got to have more than one. And they come to see a live show, and it's just me doing all those varying styles. So, and then past that, it's like, I mean, I grew up listening to, of course, like, you know, uh, bands like Korn and stuff that, and, and whenever they first hit, that was my my first branch into, I guess, as close to our style as possible. It's like, I grew up listening to more, like, punk rock and a lot of, like, old goth stuff, like Bauhaus, Joy Division, stuff like that. And then um, Korn came along, and I started listening more to like rock and metal and then of course corn pretty much you know was one of the earliest in the new metal scene and i really took a strong attachment to new metal early on um i just liked the versatility that you saw within it so and right next who are your influences uh well growing up it was a lot of country uh of course being raised by my grandparents did they yeah. the rock and roll was cats being beaten across the guitar as john calls one of my <laughs> songs one day uh <laughs> but um and uh, one day at school, me and buddy of mine, we got together, and he showed me this band called Disturbed. Mm. And it was it, it was like a long lost puppy that you has been gone for so long, and you're crying today, and all of a sudden you found it's like, ha! Ah! It was right there. It was it. That, that sold it for me, and it was just got heavier and heavier and heavier on from there, even down to death metal, I expect. Yeah. And it was it was a lost cause for me at that point, I think, as far as the country music goes. That's really but, cool. And Viking. I've, I've been playing drums on and off for most of my life. Uh, my parents were in a country band way before I was born. Uh, they still play here and there. And I just, they, I got a hold of a drum set and started learning how to play drums just to play with my dad. So it was all a lot of like easy stuff. Then I got into high school, started learning some jazz stuff. And then I took a break, like a six year break. And then yeah. these guys come and pull me back in. <laughs> I'm like, guys, I haven't played drums in six years. They're like, come jam with us. <laughs> and then next thing I know, I'm back on stage and playing like I played six years ago, better than I played six years so, ago. So let me get this I, yeah. I didn't take over. <laughs> so you just said I was playing drums in a jazz band, then I took a break, and then now I'm playing drums in a metal band. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, happens. it happens. Makes it happens. all the sense in the world. But we got him behind a kit with us, and... Um, and it was it was just the, the perfect matchup immediately. It's like because it's not only about how you come together musically; it's also about how you come together as a unit. You know, it's like absolutely. Yeah. And he meshed so perfectly well with all of us. Like he said, I mean, his first night out, just and we just goofed off mostly, and he had so much fun. And I was just like, that's that's the, the first important part is like you've got to have fun with us. And that definitely translates to the audience too. I mean, okay. you can definitely tell as a fan if I'm sitting there and the, the band is just like you know stonewalling each other all night long. It's mm-hmm. like I mean. I know a handful you of bands. You really want me to come back and watch this again? I've you know? seen some bands around here where you can tell that there's always, that if there's like that one member that other people are in the band are just like, eh. Yes. Unsure of, and it causes that tension. Yep. You can feel it on the If you side. go to a lot of shows, it's one of the first things you pick up, boy. And I'm telling any genre. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, I mean, if you're if you're battling for a solo, I mean, you, you can definitely catch that off stage. We had some of that trouble in our earlier, our earlier, uh, I don't line up format, whatever you want to call it, but our current our current lineup has been it's the perfect mesh. It's been we uh, we we all get along really well and we work well together, so it's it's helped. And you guys have a basically a five piece with a sound engineer, right? So uh, well, we still consider ourselves a six piece. Yeah. Um, he actually does occasionally 
play and we'll be playing more uh, he's going to be doing some more of the like live live stuff like a lot of keys and stuff like that um, but yeah he's on stage controlling everything that way quick problem solving also yep. the ability to add in you know live fire samples and stuff like that so it's I like actually having that on stage a lot of bands just hit play and go but I actually like the ability to have someone there who he's he's the I mean he's the brains behind all that you know our, our entire edge of our, you know, our music that industrial edge so having him on stage also to, to live fire the samples to be able to play stuff along with us it's it's the perfect setup so I mean I like being a, the full six piece it works out well so you mentioned the word industrial and I gotta say you know I'm I've been a metal fan here and there throughout the years I've never really heard anybody <clears throat> define what industrial means so try to try to tell us a little bit about what that means to you guys well, early industrial was more defined by, well, when you think industry, you think about the sound of industry as kind of like that continuous grinding, like a piston moving, you know, it's that kind of, and a lot of early industrial focused heavily on that repetition and those grinding rhythms and things like that. Um, also, it's, it's you know, bl- blending in, it's the electronic elements and, uh, like, yeah. like <laughs> the, the way I describe it is, uh, like, you have heavy guitar, heavy drums, but then all that backing samples and stuff behind it, you're just driving it along. So like the drums may be simple, the guitar riffs may be simple, but all that electronic stuff behind it is what's pushing it through. Gotcha. So it's it's just that perfect blend of the two the two elements there. It's like, like a well oiled machine. And is that what you guys would would say your genre basically is? Is it in, industrial? Metal industrial. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's the, that's, that's the one I got to pick today whenever it was, I was asked what type of metal whenever I was uploading our stuff. Is it metal, <laughs> it's metal industrial is literally what we're under. Okay. Well, it's better than tolerable rock like Trevor yeah. Newsom said. <laughs> if you guys listen to the Victims of Sanity podcast, <clears throat> I said to him, I said, what kind of rock do you guys play? And he's like, well, after about five minutes of trying to answer, he just goes, ah, it's tolerable. Tolerable. <laughs> So now every time I see Trevor, I'm just like, yeah, you're right. It is kind of tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you guys are constantly in the studio cranking out that music. So what drives you guys to work so hard to just keep pumping out the, those tracks? Desire to excel. Yeah. I'm just, we, uh, we want to be the best at what we do. Somebody will play something and we're like, hey, record that. You know, like we need it for later. And then we'll come back to it later and be like, oh, we forgot we recorded this and we'll add to it. Right. And just keep building and building that way. It's just been this, the songs have almost taken on a life of their own. But since we started working this way, it's you find that one perfect riff and then you record it and then we go back and we listen to that and someone else will add, add a piece and it's like they seem to take a life of their own. Right. And we're just kind of nurturing them along. You right. Know? It's like there are there are kids. I mean, it's like we're taking care of them and helping them grow. And when I met Johnny at, at Clicks Live and we were out in the patio area, he's just like, man, we just had an EP come out. We got another one coming in November. Another one coming here. Another. I'm just like, oh my God, you have so much music like yeah. coming. And I mean, it's like usually you, you see a local band and they're they're lucky just to get one EP out. So when I see someone like just spitting them out over and over again, I'm, I'm like, man, that's different. That's unique. I've met a lot of bands that think that they, 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 they fight with themselves. Like they'll put a little demo together and then they'll hold back on the EP and then they'll finally do an EP. And they'll sit on it thinking, because they're still waiting for that magical moment that a record exec's going to walk into a gig and sign them a record contract. Right. And I say to that, it's ridiculous to wait. It's like there's no sense in waiting around when you can produce yourself and get yourself out there. Work hard, like, you know, it's like we do. It's like we, we constantly promote, we constantly record, we constantly write. It's, you got to produce yourself these days. It's like don't wait around for this myth, mythical moment that rarely even happens these, anymore these days right. so it's so like, what 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 different benefits do you see in putting out so much music like better. specifically uh, well i mean i think because of our love of music to go back to that next question going into this one here would be that it's it's our love of music we want to put something out there that is not necessarily just quantity but quality as well uh, we all want to everybody to love the type of music, love the music the way that we like love it. Right. You know, this is this is our career choice. This is what we want to do and so that's why we put out so much is so that everyone can enjoy what we enjoy. They can see this they can enjoy the side of it that we do. And I know that there's a lot of strategy involved with it too, you know, where you guys are trying to make each one sound a little bit differently than the one before so that way you guys aren't pigeonholed and you're making more fans because of that as well. Mm-hmm. So I mean I know there's a lot of strategy, and that's one thing that impresses me about you guys is the strategy that's behind your music. You're not just doing it to do it. 
you actually have a plan. Um, so tell us about what that's like to, you know, really thinking about that strategy and the order of things, if, if, if you know what I mean. Well, we, uh, how can I put this? We treat this as what we want it to be, which is a, a, a business, you know, a future. You know, it's, uh, we, don't, we, we play music because we love music, but we also play music because we want to do this for the rest of our lives. Right. This is what we all want to do for a living. This is the future we want to have. Um, so we see that at that point, then we're now responsible for making that happen on our own. It's like, I'm not going to wait for someone to, to hand me a contract or, or just, you know, I, I, there's no sense in waiting around for something we can do on our own. And so it's just a matter of, this is our dream. We're going to make it happen on our own if we, you know, instead of waiting around for someone to make that dream happen. And, uh, it drives all of us really hard. It's, uh, you know, it's, I'm a bit of a taskmaster. I mean, they'll all, they'll all say I'm a jerk at times. I mean, he's over here nodding his head. Yes. <laughs> but um, whenever I first, it's like I think, like I mentioned to y'all before, is that I uh, I hadn't done music in a while. Whenever uh, an old fan and friend convinced me to start looking at getting back in again, and uh, I was like, well, if I'm going to do this this time, I've got to find people that are dedicated and willing to work. It's like I'm not going to sit around and just play dozens upon dozens upon dozens of shows and see nothing from it. Yeah. At this time, it's like I came in. It's like, look, my word, my word's law. It's like I need that to be a rule. It's like if I have a problem with something, then we need to be able to move past it and keep going, instead of getting bogged down on politics or on issues or on a, if someone, you know, half the band doesn't like a song and the other half does, we need to be able to just squash it quick and keep rolling. It's like we don't need that bog, those bogged down. Yeah, that's that very I see smart. So very smart. This needs to be run like a business instead of just run like a bunch of guys hanging out, you know, and having fun, which we do have a blast. I mean, we're an insane group of people <laughs> and all very different we, we, we throw insults at each other constantly and everything else I mean but it's all in good fun and we're all still laughing at the end of the night so that's what well I gotta say you know you guys are a prime example of why I wanted to start this show this particular podcast to shine a light on East Texas musicians um, you guys are a good example of a band that you know if somebody went out and saw you guys live they'd probably have a great time but they wouldn't know anything about you they wouldn't know the story behind it. They wouldn't know how hard you work, how much you guys think, you know. Um, and, and that's why I love this show and why we're doing this is because I love to hear somebody like what you just said. You know, there's a lot of thought going into it. We're not just plastering this stuff out there so people are sick of edge of misery. It's, it's you know, there's a strategy involved. And it's it's nice to be able to sit with, with bands and musicians and producers and, and find out that story behind kind of the veil, you know what I mean? And... and that's, I just wanted to say that based on what you just said. So I know you guys are very, I mean, audio-wise, you guys are truly unique, but um, visually, <laughs> um, you guys have some on-stage theatrics, I guess is the best way for, for me to say that. So tell us a little bit about that and, and what you guys are thinking when you, when you start doing stuff like that. And what is it exactly? I personally like the idea of the masks because, not just for the sake of anonymity, it's like... It's nice to go out somewhere and not have to talk to people that just saw your show on the weekend. Like, my wife and I will go out for lunch on, on Sunday, and people that were at the show the night before, you know, and we've been stopped, and I'll end up talking for an hour. It drives her nuts. And yeah. So the anonymity is one, is, is nice, but that's not even it. It's, it's the ability to step outside yourself a little bit. You put the mask on, and you become the persona that you are for the music. You know, it's like, it, at that point, it is just the music that exists in your life. It's... Who you normally are on a daily basis just kind of dissolves away and you can just point you know point forward and just it's about this show it's about the music it's like we are you know our individual names of edge of misery tonight not not the guy that works down the road at whatever we work exactly. at or whoever we are every other day it's it's we become these characters that we've kind of put together over time so did you guys ever hear of a man named uncle dallas uh yeah, yeah. Uncle Dallas was a good friend of mine, and he once told me, he said, you know, Boston, every time you go into public, um, do or wear something that'll make people remember that you were there. You know, so I would, uh, just playing around, I would just do crazy stuff, you know. I'd be, I'd wear a backwards hat or, you know, or a fedora or th that went not, didn't even go with what I was wearing, you know, like a pair of Adidas shorts with a fedora on, you know. People were like, what the heck is he doing? And I'd be like, you remember me, though, don't you? 
But see, Uncle Dallas, everywhere he went, he wore a red cowboy hat with the drawstrings down and everything, you know? So I, I completely get it, you know? It's like people come to your show, you're visually crazy, <laughs> you're mysterious, you're, you know, and then the sound comes out, and that's equally as unique. So um, uh, it takes a lot of creativity to do that, um, just not just musically, but, you know, visually as well. So do you guys all partake in that, or is it? Yes. Is... Yeah, every single one of us know. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So uh, where do those ideas come from? Do you guys kind of sit around and throw stuff at the wall? Or do you just say, I'm going to wear this tonight and I don't care what you think? Viking found the new masks for uh, for Redneck and Speck. You know, you, I was you just, kind of... just jumping through the internet one day and I found one mask and I was like, that would look perfect on Speck. I mean, it goes with this whole character. And then found another one that was similar but different. And I was like, well, there's one for Redneck. And then I found one for me and then I broke it. <laughs> I'm on my. This is why on, we can't have nice things. I'm on my second mask. Uh, Johnny's on his, I think, third mask by now. Do you guys switch them up from show to show too? Well, not, not really. Now we have we have our definitive masks now. Because uh, funny that the one that the Vikings taking over is the one that I actually used when we were at Acadia in Houston, and it killed me because it was a hard plastic mask. And it was digging into. <laughs> like the sides of my chin and it drove me nuts trying to sing with it so I'm like I've got to go with soft latex so it'll stretch and move <laughs> uh, for my next mask and he put it on and ran around in it that night and thought it was really awesome so I was like hey there you go you can take that one repaint it do your own thing with it and uh, and then I'll, I'll find something for me and then I finally found one that I liked online and uh, I'll be wearing it on stage for the first time this Saturday so you guys need to come check that out to see his new mask so tell us about the people who make up your support system. You know, I, I know there's six guys in the band, but there's always people behind the scenes, whether it's a, a wife or family or friends or whatever. Uh, my wife, hands down. Uh, mm -hmm. I couldn't do what I do without her. She uh, is not only just supportive, but also just supporting. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's hard to uh, do this and because I'll be in with most of these guys, they, they have their everything, but me, I live and breathe trying to promote for this band, this band from the day. At the time I get up, I'm usually on the phone talking to somebody, or I'm bugging people on Facebook, talking to other bands in other cities, trying to see what I can find for us. I'm at the bar on the weekends passing out flyers, uh, which I think that's something that a lot of bands are forgetting about. I don't see that enough. And then, But then Completely they want to whine and say, it's like, agree with you. I had someone one, one time told me that the reason that they don't bother flyering is because they don't believe there's enough people at the other shows, like the week before them or the week before that, and I'm like, doesn't matter. You give out, you know, if you give me, even if you pull five of those people from, an, you know, from going out and flyering, it was worth your, your night going well, out. Well, not just flyering, but also, you know, just, you know, even if you're in a room with four fans, you still mm -hmm. got to mention the Facebook page, you know? Oh, yeah. Because, you know, every every like, every click on that page is a little I bit, you're Face a little bit bigger every time. In a way, I almost consider Facebook a curse to the music industry because it's made people lazy. At least in your smaller bands. In a way, yeah. The big I bands agree. still have to do the bigger, the bigger promotional stuff, but a lot of your smaller local bands have gotten lazy. They think, oh, I'll post an event and I'll invite a bunch of people, and that's all the promotion I have to do. No. And I come from old school. I mean, I was doing punk rock shows 20 years ago, where if you didn't go out and flyer, no one came to your show because there was no social media. I mean, there was barely internet, so I <laughs> mean. Uh, you had to get out, and we were out there with the staplers and the telephone poles and posting right. on flyers and everything else. And, and we'd have, you know, 80 to 100 people show up at these little tiny punk rock shows because we got out there on, on foot and we promoted. Mm -hmm. And I've kept that mindset ever since. And it's like, and right. we've, uh, see, we, we've, been, we've been called the, like the, the most insane promoters by more than one person. It's like, it's, we just, we do work at it. It's like, we, we believe it's necessary. Well, I mean, I met you at someone else's show. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer of you get in what you put, or you put, get out what you put in. Absolutely. And you know, a lot, a lot of it, you know, for me was as far as support is my core group of friends. You know, just not just these guys here. They're, you know, they're, of course they're all friends and family to me. But the guys that I grew up with, my dad, my brothers, my sister, everyone, even even the guys that I ride motorcycles with, they even though they don't particularly like our type of music, they still always share stuff on Facebook, yep. tell people about it. If I if I can hand them flyers, they'll go out and put them up in different venues that they go to on their deals when they go out to drink a beer or, or whatever. And it just makes it that much better. I mean, it, it's really nice to have that core group of people behind me. Uh, as far as people we want to like thank and our supporters and whatnot, I'd really like to thank uh, Mr. David Wilson. He's the, uh, the front of house engineer Amen for Clicks that. Live. Hell yeah. The guy's been around since day one of this band, even before I was in it. Uh, he's been, you know, suggesting things they can do to make their sound a little bit better. 
even after I joined, he's still like, hey guys, I like the sound, but maybe try this. He's definitely one of those minds. Yes. Uh, you know. He's got so much just talent in himself. Right. And then just his ears for music is just crazy because I brought in a sample from our EP and I played it for him and I was like, what do you think? He's like, I really like it. It's really well mixed, but uh, there's like these two things I have a problem with. He's like, they're not a big thing. It's just I personally have a problem with them. I was like, what? He's like, well, these two frequencies are too high. I, like, I didn't even hear that. Right. And he did. Yeah. And he told me exactly which ones they were. I take it back to our producer. And he's, and like, he's in a cool. great band, too. Oh, yes. I mean, this yeah, day this day four. Oh, this day four. Oh, they're we, great. We love, we love those guys. We've, we've had the <coughs> to play with them. Uh, it was uh, Power Man 5000. Mm-hmm. That, that was, was awesome an amazing show. show. And we, we still, we, we love, like, I, I try to catch as many of their shows as I can. Just that Power Man 5000 anyway. almost got me killed in New York City. <laughs> oh, wow, really? <laughs> when that When Worlds Collide, <laughs> you remember that song? Yeah. Yeah, I drive way too fast when that comes on. <laughs> way too fast. The crowd's still going insane. Man, I'm coming up the Jersey Turnpike, and they have those uh, the tolls right there at the at the George Washington Bridge. <laughs> Power Man 5000's on. You don't care about toll booths. I've learned this. What about you, Spec? <laughs> so, Spec, what 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 exactly do you bring to Edge of Misery? Uh, well, like I for the past. Five years. I've been. I was in active duty in the army, and I had like I was. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Uh, but I was. I would sit in my room, and I would just sit there and play my guitar. But I didn't really have anything. I had nothing to do with it. I would just sit there and play guitar and do covers and stuff like that. And uh, whenever I finally got out of active duty, and uh, I went to up to Clicks to see a show, and uh, actually Richard, one of the old drummers from Victims of Sanity, he actually uh, pointed me over to Edge of Misery. Is that Richard yeah. Lackey? Richard yeah, Lackey, no. With, uh, with Panic Device. Yeah, with Panic Device. I've known him for, I don't know how long, how many years? 20 before plus. you were born. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he pointed me over to John, and he, John brought me in to, uh, to uh, jam, with you, jam with him, and it just kind of, like, took off from there, but... Similar uh, stories for everybody. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I'm, I'm catching that. I, it's almost like you guys I see were, something I want. <laughs> <laughs> John just goes after it. I, I really do. I think that's exactly how this band has come together. Because it's like I, oh, except for except for uh, Spox, that was just fate. Yeah, he found I mean, us. I'm up at Clicks talking to this guy that I, I'd never met before, chit chatting with him, and told him he said that's the one thing I've always wanted is that industrial element added to my music, and that was like a dream of mine since I started singing, and. Um, He's like, well, meet my brother. And I was like, what? And so I started talking to this guy, and 10 minutes in, it's like he's like, he's showing me some stuff that he's some, he, some of his own stuff he uh, produced on his own and everything else. It's like, you're coming to a practice. He's like, okay. So and it just, I was like, he played stuff. I was like, I want him in the band. And I got him in the band. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like you're collecting like Pokemon Go or something. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, it's like what? Pest got in the band because we had a, we had a bass player, and uh, she – Ditched out in the middle of a practice, and, and you know she had her own thing to do. She had her own life, and I understand that. And uh, she left one night, and then he, I was like, dude, pick up the bass. We need to work on this song, and because I knew you could play a little. And I was like, just grab the bass. We're trying to write, and so he grabbed the bass and started fiddling around. And we we wrote most of the song in like the 30 minutes she was gone. She came back, and then he tried to show her what he showed her what he was doing. She stayed with us for maybe a week or two, and then she actually left. She uh, resigned from us. But I was able to keep him because I kept thinking, I knew he was going to be in the band somewhere. Just having him around practice, I was thinking, he needs to be with us. I just don't know where. And then, you know, and I met, uh, you know, with Redneck. It was just kind of a, like I said, we uh, had posted uh, something that we, it was when we first formed it. We were looking for guitarists. And, uh, don't tell me Craigslist. No. no. That's, uh, no. So many people say that. I found him no. on Craigslist. No, uh, that was a Facebook post. And then he contacted a, a, someone who uh, was with us at one time. And then that, the person put him in touch with me. Heard him play. I was like, well, you're in. Um, <laughs> it's one of those yes moments. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, had a, we had a drummer in the past um, who will remain nameless. But I was hanging out out back after a show that we had played. And I was, I was talking with, with, with Viking here and with actually with David uh, from Clicks. And... We're talking, you know, about you know that's the one the one thing is that it was just, the drum beat seemed to be the same beat yeah. constantly with our former drummer, and I, I knew it and I'd heard it and I was just trying to ignore it, and um, and we were still just kind of doing the groove metal thing at the time, so it, it worked okay, and then Viking here mentions uh, it's like well you know I play drums and I'm thinking about getting back into it, it's like oh really 
<laughs> well, you should jam with us sometime. And he's like, well, yeah, I'm thinking about it, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, okay, cool, you know, I kind of let it go. And then I was back up at Clicks, what, like two days later? Mm -hmm. So you want to jam with us sometime? I did not leave, leave him alone about it. I was right. like, because he was talking about, hey, there's, there was another band apparently that had also wanted you to come and everything yes. else. I just stayed on his case because it's like, I knew I already liked, liked just hanging out with him. And that, like I said, that's an important element. You have to have that. Yeah. Like, like enjoy being around the someone to, yeah. to make music with them. And I was like, I, this guy, I've got to get this guy in the band. And so I just stayed on him until he finally said yes, came and jammed with us. And well, so you're kind of like that guy from Despicable Me, you know, like just collecting all these minions. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're in, you're in, you're in. No, not you. No, no. <laughs> I like, like you're from Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> like I said, it's like I want us to be, you know, I want us to be, you know, amazing at what we do. So it's like I think it's important that. You know, me as you know, as just as a front man and songwriters, that I, I want to surround myself with people that I think are all amazing, and every one of these guys are fantastic. Right. I, I'm I'm incredibly blessed to have these guys uh, working. To I mean, it's taken you a while to to kind of find that mix too, you know. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've spent years and I've gone through many other bands over the years, you know, trying to find what I was looking for. Right. And finally have it with, our, with what we've got now. This current lineup is uh, is my perfect band. So. So I know one of the struggles in this region being East Texas is, I mean, many artists, uh, for many artists, venues are primarily booking like, you know, rock and country and, and more, I mean, those are really popular in East Texas and Texas as a whole, really. Um, so, I mean, as a little bit of a less popular genre, like metal and, you know, things like that, how do you handle the challenges of getting your music out there? We push through. I mean, we, we don't back up. We don't give up. I mean, if. If there's a venue that they don't they want us, and even though we try to get there, then we go find something else. You know, we don't let anything hold us back. And most of your bigger cities definitely have a metal scene. I mean, right. But, I mean, my memory still goes back to, I remember, like, clicks back like around 06 to 08, 09, back whenever a metal show would pack in a couple hundred easy on just every Saturday night. I mean, over, you know, like... 200 people easy every Saturday night people coming out for metal shows and because back then like I said the bands promoted the bands pushed and but then the scene kind of went through a lull under some uh, some previous management where booking wasn't being taken care of the way it should have been and a lot of bands either broke up fell off uh, newer bands that were coming onto the scene weren't being allowed in weren't being booked there and so the metal scene took a major hit and um, my, my, my goal is that you know we're trying to help get these other bands and get people in is that i want to see the scene back to that again i want to see the metal scene in east texas and, and, and right now currently i mean do you guys feel that you have to go to houston and dallas to be successful it's not absolutely necessary but we enjoy doing it oh, yeah. it's like we just got back we just played down a show down in houston recently it was a phenomenal <coughs> phenomenal night and then yeah when we're uh, we're talking with some uh, some booking guys in dallas we're about to start branching back that direction again our goal has been is like we've been trying to work on this new this new CD, and then as soon as it drops, we'll have two EPs under our belt. Like everyone keeps asking us why we haven't done more out of town. It's like it's literally I wanted us to get our first two EPs under our belt, get our name out there, just doing a lot of online promotion, and then we're gonna hit the road hard. And uh, but getting out there with something, so I've been in too many bands hitting the road with maybe a demo CD if you were lucky and no merch. And right. yeah, you can build up a little bit of a fan base when you travel, but nothing compares to having. You know, a full merch table and something, and then also putting on that stage show and having something that you can put in people's hands that they'll be able to remember you whenever you come back through. Right. Because I know as an outsider, as a fan, and watching how the music scene is, and of course also being associated with the awards, you know, it, it hurts me because I know metal is, I mean, there's so many talented bands here in East Texas, and there's just not a whole lot of places for them to play. And it just it frustrates me, and I'm not even in a band. So, I mean, I can imagine what it's like for... We used to have so many more places to play. I mean, there was one right here in Kilgore for the longest. It was one of my favorite yeah, things right, to play. Yeah, right, the side pocket. The side pocket. Yeah. I loved playing there. Just like I used to really enjoy. I mean, there was several different places that had been in Longview back in the day. Right. I mean, between Legends and Cantons, mm -hmm. and there was a little party zone the levee, place. Yeah. And, uh, the Levee, and... Um, just a lot of the a lot of the venues have kind of de have just vanished or faded. I mean, you know, in Tyler right now we've got we've got uh, what two? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'd say uh, we got clicks, and then uh, yeah, the other venue we really play at is uh, the DIY spot. Uh, but not to mention uh, nine, muses. Oh, nine muses. Oh, nine uh, muses. We haven't played yeah, and then we well we did just those two <coughs> shows and coaches. Yeah, that was 
There's other good shows. Technically Cowboys. Yeah. But I know there's one or two in Texarkana. I think there's one in Nacogdoches. Mm-hmm. Um, the venues are out there. It's just a matter of getting right. Getting in them. So what, uh, as a band, what can music fans do to make it easier for bands such as yours to get more gigs? Request us at your venues. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell, tell you know, tell people in your towns, you know, hey, I really, I heard this band, I really want them to come play here, and tell the venues to contact us directly. I mean, that's like we've got a number posted. Uh, I think that's another thing is that you know, it's like a lot of play. Well, I mean, I used to book, and I hated dealing with people strictly through internet. I prefer that hands-on approach and be able to actually call and talk to a band. Right. And uh, that's why I posted. I mean, it's it's actually my personal number as well. It's. Uh, and that's how you get in touch with us is the easiest way. I mean, there, we have our email, edgeofmiserymusic at gmail.com. You can message us on Facebook and so many different ways to get a hold of us, but the direct number is usually ends up being the easiest. Right. But is there anywhere you guys with. won't go to play? <laughs> Not really. Yeah. You can put us in a backyard with some people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we've, uh, we've got an outdoor show later in October. We're uh, playing that, that metal fest thing out in uh, Or City. Or City. Oh, nice. Yeah. We're playing with uh, Dark Side of Daylight, God's Monk's Men, uh, a couple of them. No, Victims of Sanity, of course, yes. Uh, <laughs> you might have to go to that one. When's that, in November? No, uh, no, October 22nd. Mm-hmm. <sighs> All right. We'll have to try to find a way, maybe. <laughs> it's going to be fun. <laughs> There's just so much music. <laughs> so much. I'm telling you. Is it really a bad thing? No, it's not, but when you, like, we hear about so many different shows, and we, there's always, like, three or four of them every weekend that we legitimately want to see, you know? So it ends up just us staying home, because a lot of times, I mean, we can hurt people's feelings if we go to one and not another. So we end up staying home a lot of time, because, I mean, we love all the bands so much, and we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings by going to one and not another. So, but... Yeah, October twenty second is one of those days where I know of at least now five shows that I'd really love to see. <laughs> that's just how it works. It's like I realized a long time ago I can't save everyone's feelings whenever I go out and try to catch all my friends' bands. Well, that's why you wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just quit buying bands all together. <laughs> yeah, well, that way I could just find someone else to wear my mask and go to one show. Yeah, there you go. I'll, I'll you guys just all show. wear masks and say, "Yeah, we're disturbed." <laughs> <laughs> So, so do you guys have any advice for anyone who may want to get into like a lesser known or lesser popular genre like metal or bluegrass or folk or anything that's not, you know, mainstream around here, but might be intimidated by the struggle of booking performances? I'll, I'll tell you from uh, my experience as a DJ, if you play what you want and you have fun playing what you want, people are going to be attracted to that. If you play what everyone else wants to hear, they're not they're just gonna take you for granted absolutely if you play what you want what you like people see that they, they see you have fun they see you like us like we get up there we jam we have fun and we go crazy a lot of what my dad would say uh, back years ago when i first got into playing in bands he would say it doesn't matter it how far you make it or if you make it at all as long as you're having fun that's all that matters Absolutely. I mean, it's it's you know, and it's, there's a lot of people get stressed out about it. Like what you're talking about, they they get stressful over booking the show or getting into less less popular band. But I mean, all that really is just that's just that's stuff on the side. Right. I mean, as long as you're having fun with a good group of guys, gals, whoever, then that it's all good. <laughs> Those are just small obstacles to just step over and keep rolling. You know, do you do what makes you happy? Right. I mean, if you truly love music, and it's like he's saying, it's like the people can tell. And that people are attracted to seeing a group that enjoys what they're up there doing. It's like, don't let anything like booking bother you. And then if you play a show or you play in front of two people, still give it your 110%. Like we have played a show in front of literally like two people and the bartender at a, at a, at a venue. And we still gave it everything that night. We had a blast oh, yeah. doing it. Yeah, it was still a fun show. <laughs> it's like playing in front of tens and tens of people. It was matter, all in my head. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're playing in front of 500 or 5, you still that's give right. it everything right. you got. And, and that's one thing that we're trying to create with the awards is, uh, you know, we're multi-genre, we're every genre, and, and East Texas music has every genre here. I mean, uh, when I first gotten involved with this, uh, you know, I'll be honest, the, I saw country bands and I saw rock bands. I didn't know there was metal, I didn't know there was rap, hip-hop, bluegrass, jazz, Latin, I mean, it's all here. And it's frustrating as a promoter to see whole styles of music that are failing 
that are here and legitimately very talented kind of falling by the wayside. And as, you know, a metal band of the year, award winning now, do you guys feel any pressure in, in kind of, you know, you guys are kind of representing an entire brand of music here locally now? It's definitely different. <laughs> definitely different. Of course, now, you know, with, uh, especially what John was saying earlier, you know, now that we're do that, you know, we're, you know, we're not going to give up. We're not going to stop. You know, it's, it's going to be one of those things where, you know, y'all voted for us. Y'all got us here. We're going to keep putting it back to y'all and make sure that y'all get the best quality stuff from us that we can, you know, uh, but pressure wise, meh, I don't think so. At least not for me anyway. He might. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Uh, yeah, no pressure whatsoever. I do feel we, we now, we do have a little bit of responsibility at the scene. Yes. Um, now, I mean, we've got that, that title tacked onto our name now. So for, for us, I feel we are now, we do have a certain responsibility to the metal scene and helping it grow and helping it thrive. And as I mentioned before, as revitalizing the scene as much as we possibly can help it along. That's awesome. And you guys, I know you guys were extremely surprised by winning that oh, award. Yeah. <laughs> I was in the bar. <laughs> like, I was in the Lucky bar. you. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting a drink. I was, I was struggling to... with my tux. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was talking to Handsome Rob, and I, all of a sudden I hear, and, you know, 2016 Metal Band of the Year is, and I was like, hold that thought, and took off running. <laughs> yeah. And then was... I hear Edge of Misery, and I wanted a dead sprint to catch up to John, who was already halfway up the aisle. We're, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're relatively new. I mean, what, September was two years since the first time we played a show, and that was a rich, that was former lineup of the band. Yeah. We've been with our new sound for About maybe six, six months. Yeah, six yeah. months. And in that short of time, though, it's like we've really grown a fan base that are, that just are behind us so much, and they, you know, they're spreading the word and helping us get our name out there. And uh, we, we love every single one of them. It's like we, we couldn't do this without them. The support of our friends, our fans, and our families. Um, it's, but yeah, I feel that we, we it's do It's overwhelming, have isn't it? Uh, me, me. <laughs> I wouldn't call it overwhelming. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel we have a little bit of responsibility to try and help the scene. If I ever heard my name called out for an award, I would scream. I'm not gonna lie, I'd be like. I think I felt the color, like the blood, blood <laughs> out of my face. which you couldn't tell because I was wearing a mask. Wearing a mask. Yeah. I was wearing a mask, I, and I, uh, I took off running so I wouldn't scream. <laughs> Is that why you weren't talking on stage? You were still yeah. trying to catch your breath. <laughs> Let the guy with the beak talk. <laughs> I had to sprint to catch up. He was already halfway up the aisle when I came out of the bar. So I was looking for him. I saw I saw you behind me. So I figured I'll just start walking. He'll catch up. I keep forgetting how long my legs are. So it just. Well, you were walking with a cane too, weren't you? Yeah, I was even walking with a cane. <laughs> he, was walking, he, was, he was walking with a purpose, so he was walking faster. Than he yeah, those short folks got to got to catch up. When people got ten foot strides. That is true. That's how it goes, bro. <laughs> Yeah. I just thought it was funny they come up they, to listen here not some Jolly Green John <laughs> they, they come up to accept the award and, and Johnny Edge is walking with a cane and he's got a mask on with a six inch beak at the end of it and we're, we spent probably a good 60 seconds trying to figure out how to get the microphone up underneath the beak so he could talk and there's like 60 pictures of that like of different it looks like a cartoon if you play them in order you know it's trying like, to get <laughs> get, the, get the beak up and over the mic so I can talk well, so as I tried with you holding it and I just kept bumping your hands so I was just like give me the mic <laughs> it, work. it was great though so you guys have a huge show coming up this Saturday at Clicks Live um, tell us what's going on out there at Clicks Live Saturday how people can get tickets and why they should come like it <laughs> Zombie Palooza this Saturday at Clicks Live uh, it's going to be kicking off about 3 p.m. Uh, the outside patio. We'll have uh, a couple of vendors out there. Uh, hopefully, we're at, we're in the talks with Terra Knights, having them out there to do uh, zombie face paint. Uh, I'll be out there with uh, equipment from Guitar Center to uh, be DJing on the patio. Uh, and then about 7 o'clock, the inside will open up, and we'll have all the bands kick off. Uh, we don't have a for sure order just yet. That will probably be posted the day of the show. Uh, tickets are $24 if you get them from any of us. Uh, we're all like between Tyler and Longview, so we can meet pretty much anywhere. Uh, our booking number is on our Facebook page, uh, which we'll go over in a little bit. Or you could also go to clickslive.com and buy your tickets online. They're 24 before the show. If you get them at the door, I think they go up to probably 28 Okay. And what bands are playing out there? Well, uh, Edge of Misery. Yes. Uh, obviously. <laughs> uh, Death Division, Raven Black. Unsaid Fate, Sunflower Dead, and Mushroom Head. 
He's got it down, y'all. It's yeah. the third time I've asked him. He's trying not to burp through that entire spill. Too. <laughs> <laughs> he did great. Yeah. He, his face was all red and purple. And But you heard that right. Mushroom Head is a huge band out of Cleveland. Um, not guys. Cleveland, Texas, but Cleveland, Ohio. Um, they're a great band as well. Uh, all those bands that they mm -hmm. mentioned are incredible. And they're all in the same place at the same time for only $24. Um, get your tickets. Uh, Johnny will tell you the number right now. Uh, you can call uh, us at 903-707-7294. Or you can message us on our Facebook page, which is Official Edge of Misery on Facebook. Or you just Google Edge of Misery. Our Facebook's usually the top thing that pops up. So. Or you can go to clickslive.com to get those as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you heard where their Facebook is. Make sure you come out and get one of their EPs. It's called Drop Dead Beautiful. It's an awesome, awesome EP. And uh, they have another one coming out November 5th, which is called Call of the Damned. Call of the Damned. And they're going to have a release party for that EP at Clicks Live um, on November 5th. So make sure you check that out as well. Uh, remember, you guys, to keep on supporting local music. Nope, not yet. I have to thank our sponsor for this episode, Mr. Neil Laney with Neil's Guitars and More, once again helping us out with ETX Rocks almost all the time. We certainly appreciate him very much. Make sure you go on his Facebook page, which is called Neil's Guitars and More. Check him out right there in Kilgore. Neil, wake up. <laughs> remember to keep on supporting local music. And ETX Rocks. We are ETX Rocks! <laughs> <laughs>